that in mind. The next item of business is debate on motion 12856 in the name of Anna Sarwar on access to vital medicines. Uh, I would ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Anna Sarwar to speak to and move the motion for up to eight minutes. Presenting officer, I move the motion in my name. I stand today to speak up for patients in Scotland who have no voice. For the patients with breast cancer or cystic fibrosis who have been denied access to vital life prolonging medicines due to bureaucracy. Fail by a system that has placed a value on their life and decided the price tag is too high. Mums and dads, a son or daughter, a brother or sister, people who need this parliament today to stand up for them, to make their voice heard in the hope that the Scottish Government listens and acts. Many of the patients we are speaking of don't have much time. It is too late for many of them to benefit from these medicines. Yet what time they do have, they are using to campaign so that others don't find themselves in the same position. In the position of knowing they have a terminal illness, of knowing there are drugs available that will allow them to spend more time with their families, time they won't get without the drugs they need. One of those drugs is Progetta, a breast cancer drug which prolongs your life for 16 months. 16 months more with your loved ones. Breast Cancer Now deserve our thanks for leading this campaign and they've been helped by the bravery of patients. Today, we are their voice. Presenting officer, last week, John Ashworth, the Shadow Secretary of State for Health in England, and I met with Breast Cancer Now and campaigners in Edinburgh. It is completely unacceptable that John's constituents in Leicester will be given access to Progetta to prolong their life, but my constituents in Glasgow are being denied it. Women in England, Wales and Northern Ireland can get Progetta on the National Health Service as a matter of course, but in Scotland, they can't. It has been rejected three times by the Scottish Medicines Consortiums as it is not considered cost effective despite it being recognised as clinically effective. So again, I ask, what cost on life? The other drug referred to in our motion is the life-prolonging cystic fibrosis drug, or CAMBI. It slows the decline in lung function by 42%, which is the main cause of death from the condition. It also cuts the number of infections that require hospitalisation by more than 60%. As we heard in the debate last week, the longer the delay in approving access to our CAMBI, the greater the decline in lung function for cystic fibrosis sufferers. That's why the matter has to be treated urgently, has to be treated urgently. Professor Gordon McGregor, a cystic fibrosis consultant, spoke about his anger that he has the drugs to prolong his patient's life in his cabinet, but he doesn't have the permission to prescribe them. In some of those occasions, the pharmaceutical company has even given the drug for free on compassionate grounds, but the clinician still can't prescribe them due to bureaucracy. Again, I would like to put on record my thanks to the Cystic Fibrosis Trust, the patients and the campaigners. But presenting officer, it shouldn't take the courage of individuals to come forward and share their very personal stories on the front page of a national newspaper, or indeed for some individuals, in the example of Anne McLean Chang, to crowdfund on Facebook to get the Scottish Government to take action and for them to get the vital drugs they need. That's why the Government must implement in full and without delay the recommendations of the Montgomery Review. This was published in December 2016. In particular, the government must deliver the ability to negotiate on price during the approval process. It makes sense that if the drug has been accepted as being clinically effective, but discussions are ongoing on cost effectiveness, that the Scottish Medicines Consortium and NHS National Services Scotland can negotiate with the pharmaceutical companies without asking them to reapply a process that can take months and months. 
Now, it appears the government will support our motion today. That is welcome. But I must say, for the Cabinet Secretary to write uh, to me confirming what recommendations will be taken forward by the end of 2018, which is welcome, just shortly before the start of this debate, uh, for her to write to Jackie Bailey and Alec Neil just today about issues they've been campaigning on, and for her to write to the Chair of the Health and Sport Committee just yesterday on these vital issues, um, only helps to uh, emphasise the fact that it shouldn't take campaigners on a front page. It shouldn't take us having to bring motions to this parliament to get action from this minister, get action from this government, so people can get access to life-saving or life-prolonging drugs. But as I say, I welcome the fact that the minister is indicating she will support our motion today. But will the cabinet secretary confirm that the ability to negotiate on price will begin now, as the motion states, not at some undefined undefined point at some point in the future in 2018. Every single day that is lost in that process is days people are being denied access to medicines. So now has to mean now. Also, can she confirm to patients and clinicians when she expects Progetta and or Cambi to be available to them? The government amendment also states that the decisions on the new individual patient treatment request, the PACS 2 process, will not be based on cost. While this is welcome in words, in practice, health boards are facing budgetary pressures, meaning they have to cut up to £1 billion over the next four years. Therefore, will the government guarantee two things? Firstly, that the new PACS 2 process will be faster in delivering access to medicines than the previous process. And secondly, that additional funds will be made available to health boards so that they can approve access to vital medicines to individual patients without knock-on pressures on existing services. Sitting officer, I would also go further and ask that the government consider a portfolio deal on cystic fibrosis medicines. Last week, the minister, Aileen Campbell, said that this wasn't possible as they couldn't spend money on drugs that weren't approved. Minister, it only starts costing money when the drug is approved and is being prescribed by clinicians. Now, I want to end with the brave words of the campaigners. Breast cancer patient, Jen Hardy. Someone an hour and a half down the road can get Progetta, but I can't. We shouldn't have to think about cost because people in England and Wales don't need to. It is terrible not only for me, but my family as well. I think about what 16 months would mean for me. It's a graduation a wedding, knowing your kids are doing okay. We need this drug now to stop women dying earlier than they should. Jane Hardy won't get Progetta, but she's campaigning for others to get Progetta. Kelly Gallagher, who is 24, and I'll end on this presenting officer, and has cystic fibrosis. She's been told that she shouldn't expect to live beyond 31. In her letter to the First Minister, she says, I don't have time to wait. These drugs are available in other countries, and to me it feels like they've been put on a shelf just out of my reach. I know they are there, but I can't get to them. More people with cystic fibrosis will die unless something is done. We need these drugs now. Please don't let us die. Presenting officer, for patients with breast cancer and cystic fibrosis, Every day matters. So please support our motion and make today matter. I call Shona Robson to speak to and move amendment 12856.3 for up to six minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, in recent years, this Parliament has driven significant change in the access to new medicines in Scotland, a system which, of course, is rightly independent of politicians. These reforms for the availability of new medicines uh, for rare, very rare and end-of-life conditions now sees the Scottish Medicines Consortium approve 79% of submissions, up from 48% between 2011 and 2013. And perhaps 
Key to changes made in the health technology assessment process has been to give the SMC greater latitude to take into account patients' lived experience when assessing medicines. On Monday, I announced further change. From October, defined ultra-orphan medicines for the very rarest conditions will be made available on the NHS for at least three years, while information about their results is gathered. The SMC will also have flexibility to allow some orphan medicines to go through the ultra-orphan process where they consider this appropriate. At my request, the Scottish Government's Chief Pharmaceutical Officer has written to the SMC to ask them to determine whether or can be might be considered in this way. We've also changed the system for individual access to medicines that are not generally available on the NHS. From the 1st of, of June, under the new peer-approved clinical system, or PACS Tier 2, the cost of a medicine is explicitly excluded from decision-making criteria when considering a clinician's request for individual access. In recent years, we've ensured that the rebate that comes to Scotland as part of the UK's pharmaceutical price regulation scheme, the PPRS, has been invested in accessing new medicines, and we will ensure this continues. In terms of... In yes, of course. Anna Sarwar. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. She mentions the uh, PAX Tier 2 process where it explicitly says that costs won't be uh, a consideration. Will she therefore make funds available to health boards who are under budgetary pressures to access those medicines um, so they don't have to worry about the cost? Shona Robson. So, first of all, it's important that clinical effectiveness is still demonstrated and we have made funds available through the new medicines fund that has been funded through the PPRS. Anna Sarwa will be aware that that is under negotiation again as we speak and I'll come back to that uh, in a moment. In terms of improving the ways of negotiating with drug companies. A number of, of steps have already been taken to better pursue best value for the NHS in Scotland. The NHS and ABPI have agreed a new voluntary system to ensure that for the first time, discounts offered to one part of the UK are made available at the same level in Scotland. And we want to go further and help NHS Scotland to negotiate for patients in new ways. To do this, it's critical that the new UK PPRS scheme leaves greater scope for NHS Scotland to negotiate with companies about their applications for new medicines. Sadly, the existing PPRS scheme, which expires at the end of this year, places very tight constraints on Scotland's scope for additional negotiation. And this prevents opportunities for negotiation as we don't, uh, con can't contravene the current PPRS terms agreed by the UK government. We've I now ask twice for Scotland to be a party to the upcoming PPRS negotiations with the industry to ensure we can secure that scope for greater flexibility in negotiation. Uh, that so far has been uh, refused. Our aim is to align the implementation of a new negotiation scheme and the implementation of the single national formula to the outcome in terms of the PPRS negotiations. And we hope that these can be concluded as quickly as possible. And as such, I'm happy to accept Miles Briggs' amendment today as well uh, um, as the, the Labour motion. Uh, I hope we can rely on support across Parliament for Scotland to receive a fair deal and the flexibility that we need from the PPRS negotiation. Presiding officer, today's motion refers to two specific medicines uh, for secondary breast cancer and for cystic fibrosis. The parliament heard just last week of the terrible toll taken on people living with cystic fibrosis and few of us will not have had a family member affected by cancer. The SMC, NHS Scotland and my officials have been working to help the companies that have developed or can be in Pergetta apply to have their medicines considered flexibly by the SMC. And I warmly welcome the undertaking undertaking offered by Roche that they will make a new application for Pergetta. That is a positive step. I also hope that the makers of our Canby will submit a fresh application too, because it is important that clinical effectiveness is established. That is the process and every company has to go through that process. Scottish Government officials met with Vertex this week to dis uh, discuss their proposals. I hope they too will uh, also engage fully and positively with assessments to ensure the clinical effectiveness of their medicines. This Parliament has helped to drive forward substantial reforms in this area, but we must also expect that some companies also reform some of their practices and come forward with far fairer prices and clear clin clinical evidence for assessment. Every other pharmaceutical company has to do that. 
presiding officer, there is little doubt that decisions around the availability of new medicines are among the most difficult issues that face government. And that is why the system is not in the hands of politicians. It is an independent system. But that system has reformed considerably. I think any reasonable person would uh, agree with that and that has meant getting more drugs more quickly into the hands of more patients. We have made advances and we will not stop uh, in our efforts uh, to make further advances in order to achieve that end and I move the amendment in my name. I now call Miles Briggs to speak to you and move amendment 12856.1 for up to five minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to contribute to today's debate about access to life prolonging medicines and thank the Labour Party uh, for bringing it forward today because I know this is of such an issue of such a huge concern and importance to many patients and their families across Scotland today. Earlier this month, working with Breast Cancer Now, I was pleased to host a summit here in Parliament to, on access to Progetta with breast cancer patients, the manufacturers and representatives of the Scottish Government and all parties in this chamber. The summit heard moving and powerful testimony from breast cancer patients like Jen Hardy from Edinburgh, who told us, I've lost out on 16 months of precious extra time with my beautiful family because I've been denied Progetta. With every moment that goes by, more women are missing out. The drug company, the Scottish Government and the SMC need to keep working to make Progetta available on Scotland's NHS. It's time to end this injustice. And I'd like to start by commending breast cancer now and individuals like Jen and many others for leading such a high profile and passionate campaign. At that meeting, we heard from another one of my constituents who gave for me what has been the most beautiful and poignant words I think I've heard spoken in the parliament. The mum of two from Portobello said, in my case, the differences of the extra time include better mental health, reducing the overwhelming guilt of leaving my gorgeous children at such a young age. Instead, I can again relax and enjoy the time with them. I can also look forward to all the fun bits of being a mum, such as being the tooth fairy, being with them as they learn to read and hopefully love books as much as I do, discovering Legoland and all sorts of wonderful places and experiences. Perhaps even more important is knowing I'll also be there at the difficult times, maybe even reassuring them as the secondary school and teenage years approach. Deputy Presiding Officer, I hope these words really demonstrate why we are debating this important issue today and why we must see urgent progress. While, of course, I welcome Roche's uh, confirmation that it will make a new bid to the SMC, Scottish campaigners and patients are understandably frustrated and angry at the delays they face to access Progetta when it's been available on the NHS in England and Wales. Similarly, in the case of Ocambi, I was pleased to speak in last week's members' debate, led by my colleague Maurice Corrie, where I highlighted constituents' strong desire for access to Ocambi, which can, as we've heard, transform the quality of life for people with cystic fibrosis. Parents from across Scotland, including people like Jenny Landers in my own region, are to be congratulated again on their campaigning efforts. But it has been because of them that we are here today, making sure that we see this change. And while today's debate focuses on Pajetta and Orkambi, in the last few weeks I've also been contacted by constituents and families who are campaigning for access on other specialist drugs for themselves and their loved ones that they consider to be absolutely vital. Families of children with rare diseases like 5Q spinal muscular atrophy types 2 and 3 want the SMC to help them provide medicines that could radically improve their lives. They desperately want a system that is responsive, transparent and fast. The Scottish Government as the organisation and ultimate, that ultimate, ultimately sets the rules around how the SMC operates needs to show that it understands and can respond to patients' wishes and as opposition MSPs, it's our job to press ministers on this and speak up on behalf of our constituents. Many elements of the Montgomery Review are welcome, but there are growing frustrations that they may not go far enough and that the implementations of some is taking far too long. My amendment today adds to Anasawa's motion and reflects what patient groups feel in relation to the need to improve the patient access scheme assessment group. Current processes are failing and they aren't able to assess in the most adequate way how highly innovative medicines, and we all will no doubt see a great more of these coming forward in, in the next few years. It's technology advances as genetic specific drugs emerge into the market. And these are gonna be small patient numbers we must be able to uh, provide access to. To conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, it's clear 
that too many patients and families across Scotland face barriers to accessing new drugs. The SNP government and parliament need to make sure that this changes and changes as soon as possible. Sadly, for too many cases we'll hear today, it's too late for patients and some families. I support Anna Sawa's motion and I move the amendment in my name. I call Alison Johnson for up to four minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. We all want patients to be able to access the treatments they need without delay. It is unthinkable that patients' health is deteriorating while medicines that could help them aren't being used. It is right that Parliament works to ensure that medicines reach the people who need them. And the best long-term solution is to improve the framework surrounding these decisions, as there will never be time in this chamber to properly consider individual medicines with the urgency that patients and all the organisations and individuals who have campaigned long and hard require and deserve. The amendment I proposed was clear that all patients need to have confidence that there's a trusted and transparent system for regulating the approval of all new medicines. Today, Cancer Research UK have emphasised that the SMC plays a vital role in assessing the clinical and cost effectiveness of new medicines independently of the Scottish Government. It's right that there should be an independent process. Ultimately, the efficacy of individual medicines must be evaluated by clinical experts. I support the motion before us today. Improvements have been needed to our overall frameworks for approving new medicines. The motion rightly highlights that the government is already committed to improving aspects of negotiating with drug companies. And I acknowledge too that we've seen some progress towards implementing the recommendations of the Montgomery Review over the last year, which the government's amendment details. I will support the government's amendment on that basis, though I appreciate the real concerns that progress hasn't been fast enough or always clear enough. I also wholly support the position that pharmaceutical companies should offer NHS Scotland fair prices and properly engage with health technology assessments. I am glad that the manufacturers of Progetta are making progress on resubmitting to the SMC and I implore the manufacturers of Orkambi to do the same because there is no time to be lost. I will also support the Conservative amendment that we remove unnecessary barriers to treatment and I'm open to some potential reform to the role of the Patient Access Scheme Assessment Group, though I'm not wholly convinced by some of the submissions made to the Montgomery Review by pharmaceutical companies who want to see the assessment group develop their role from gatekeeper to enabler. I also have reservations about urging NHS National Services Scotland, the SMC or the government to move into negotiations which are even less transparent than current processes the decisions about procurement should always be taken as transparently as possible. And if we're to urge the Scottish Government to take action beyond the SMC process, then we can't rule out other legal routes to procure medicines. The campaign group Just Treatment wants to see the Scottish Government make use of its powers to pursue a Crown Use licence in some cases. And I raised the possibility with the Cabinet Secretary recently. Now, I appreciate that it may not be a quick solution, but it has the potential to lead to much needed long-term change on drug pricing. We can't ignore the fact that manufacturers have the latitude to change their stance on price. And I very much hope that Roche have reached a position that allows the SMC to approve Progetta for general use. And I would encourage Vertex to do the same. As Just Treatment have pointed out, while we can't alter the efficacy of drugs to make them more cost effective, the price is variable, and the key driver of price will be the patent-backed monopoly held by manufacturers. Just Treatment have worked with in absolutely inspiring campaigners like Denise McIver, who've spoken so honestly and openly about the difference accessing Progetta in Scotland would make to their care and treatment. Last week, my colleague John Finney highlighted the experience of his constituent, Hannah McDermott, who's grown up with cystic fibrosis and lives with two hours of physiotherapy a day to clear mucus from her chest and lungs. It is incredible that so many constituents have put so much into campaigning for access to treatment when their own health must be their priority and they manage really complex treatment regimes. They're inspiring us, but they should be able to focus entirely on their health and well-being. Presiding officer, we must get access to medicine right in the first place so that nobody has to put time and energy, which they could be spending with their families, into leading campaigns for the treatment they need. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Willie Rennie. Thank you, President Officer. It's tough watching and reading about breast cancer patients and their ordeal. 
Who would not want to make policy changes when you learn about Jen Hardy from Edinburgh and her HER2 positive secondary breast cancer? She's been denied Pergetta and the 16 months of life it could give. When someone so exhausted with the effects of breast cancer considers moving home to another country to get treatment shows how much it matters to her. Or the 31-year-old daughter of Jacqueline McEnany, who has cystic fibrosis and would benefit from Orcambi. This week, she attended the funeral of the last of her childhood friends with the condition. Orcambi can extend her life and improve her daily quality of life as well. Only thanks to the advances in medicine is this debate even possible. Previously, there would have been no hope. Now there is. But with that comes a new set of challenges. There is an expectation on the NHS and the state to do everything possible to save our friends and relatives from the pain and early death, if at all possible. We want new medicines and innovations to be used by the NHS to improve people's lives and to encourage greater innovation from industry and researchers. But that can't be done at any price or effectiveness, because that may have an effect on the treatment and services available in the NHS, which may be equally justified, if not more so. The SMC process is specifically designed to assess the flow of new medicines from pharmaceutical companies. And because drug discovery isn't cheap, it's a difficult set of judgments to make. It has been recognised that the process for orphan and ultra-orphan conditions required adjustment. Progress since the Montgomery Review has, however, been slow. Even so, the ultra-orphan process has nothing to do with Pergetta. The PACS 2 Tier 2 system um, should give patients better chances of accessing Pergetta on an individual basis. But why is there a need to use the PAC system process when it is routinely available in England. There is a lack of clarity on what is happening with the end-of-life drugs like Pergetta. How can Pergetta be cost-effective in England but not in Scotland? Leaving aside the Cancer Drugs Fund, how was a special deal reached in England with Roche but not in Scotland? I hear what the Health Secretary says about the PPRS, but that doesn't explain why the Welsh Government has given the go-ahead. Or, in fact, in Northern Ireland, we're seeing a managed arrangement towards the use of Pergetta, certainly. Cabinet Secretary. The principles we want for the, the new PPRS deal uh, is that the companies, if they offer a, a deal to one part of the UK, that same deal should be offered to all parts. Would Willie Rennie agree with that? I, I, I would agree with that, but that doesn't explain why we're in this situation just now, while Wales and Northern Ireland seem to be moving ahead alongside England, but Scotland seems to be incapable of doing so. And Roche said at the time when it was rejected last year by the SNC, unfortunately, inflexible pricing rules means that the Scottish Government have been unable to accept our discount in full. I don't really understand what that means, and I would quite like an explanation from the Health Secretary when she sums up. Pharmaceutical companies, she says in her amendment today, should offer the same prices right across the UK. I agree with that. It doesn't explain the situation that Roche are describing. So we need to have proper some clarity about this. We, I think we all in this chamber recognise we want to solve this problem. We know the dilemma of trying to get sometimes expensive drugs through the system. But we need some clarity and we need some progress for the sake of the patients involved. Thank you. Thank you. I call Jackie Bailey to be followed by Ash Denham. Presiding officer, it was only a week ago that we had a members debate in this chamber on access to Orcambi. And I have to say that the Minister's response then was disappointing, prescripted, and offered little comfort to those for whom this drug could be life-saving. Um, the Cabinet Secretary, I believe today, has moved on from that, and that is very welcome. I would, of course, encourage her to go further. Because this isn't just about access to Orcambi, important though that is. It is about access to the next generation of drugs to treat cystic fibrosis. The drugs that are being trialled as we speak, that will transform lives. And the drugs that will follow them in a few months 
treating the underlying causes of cystic fibrosis, not simply treating the symptoms. This is actually life-changing. And according to clinicians, instead of someone with cystic fibrosis dying before they've reached the age of 31 years of age, they could live to their 70s, their 80s. They would have a normal life expectancy. And that is simply extraordinary. We have an opportunity and a duty to do something about that. Ocambi was licensed for use in 2015. The SMC recognized it was an important therapy, but rejected it on cost grounds in 2016. Two years on from that, and Ocambi is only available from the drugs company on compassionate grounds. Meanwhile, people with cystic fibrosis are dying. Presiding officer, time is something that cystic fibrosis sufferers don't have. A resubmission to the SMC would take six months, and I'm not convinced that the appraisal process recognizes the contribution to the economy that someone living and working for an additional 30 to 40 years would actually make. The way SMC measures cost and benefit doesn't even begin to fully capture this. Let me welcome the rollout of the ultra-orphan medicine pathway. I think it's great, but the truth is this applies only to conditions affecting less than 100 people. There is a gap in the system. And that's how we treat orphan conditions. Ocambi is appropriate for about 300 cystic fibrosis sufferers. So it doesn't qualify as an ultra-orphan medicine. It's very clear that there is a gap between ultra-orphan medicines and the SMC process. And I hear the Cabinet Secretary is asking to make an exemption. And that's a start for Ocambi. But it doesn't address the underlying problem. And that's where I would like her to go further. Because the other point I want to make is about a portfolio agreement. Because this isn't just an agreement about Ocambi. We need that agreement about the next generation of medicines coming down the line. Now, I know this is new. And it doesn't fit the processes the Scottish Government have. But let's not be hidebound by systems if they aren't flexible. And let me correct the Cabinet Secretary as gently as I can. New treatments in a portfolio agreement have all to be licensed first. I would have the same safety concerns that she has, and I wouldn't be recommending this if I didn't think it was appropriate, because at the end of the day, this is about patients. And, and here are the countries that have agreed a portfolio deal. Austria, Denmark, Germany, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Italy, Ireland, Greece, the United States, the Republic of Ireland, and just this week, Sweden. Let me ask the Cabinet Secretary, are all those countries wrong? Do we know better? Let me finish. A cystic fibrosis sufferers different in Scotland than in any of these other countries. Negotiate, I'm happy to give way. So Jackie Bailey has raised an important point because the portfolio approach did include unlicensed medicines in that portfolio, the safety of which remains unproven. And I'm glad she shares my concerns about that. That is a fundamental problem with the portfolio approach that really needs to be addressed. Ms Bailey, you need to conclude your remarks. And I am suggesting that we can address it if we have those negotiations. All those other, other countries have. Negotiations on such an agreement are well underway in England. They've moved on to actually negotiate. And I understand that agreement will be reached soon, perhaps even before the end of the summer. This will save the lives of cystic fibrosis sufferers in England. I cannot believe that the Cabinet Secretary wants to send a message today that we're suggesting that parents that want to save their children should somehow move to England to do so. I know, and I'm very grateful to the remarks, Cabinet Secretary in my last minute, uh, my last sentence, presiding officer, um, is going to meet with my constituent, Kelly Gallagher, next week. But Kelly doesn't have time to wait. She needs or can be now. Can I call on Ash Denham to be followed by Annie Wills? Thank you, presiding officer. As a constituency MSP for Edinburgh Eastern, I've met with constituents for whom access to potentially life-altering medicines, either for themselves or for their children, is an incredibly pressing concern. I feel the Scottish Government has acted to significantly improve access to medicines in recent years, but I know from the meetings and from the correspondence that I've received from constituents that accessing certain medicines and treatments has sometimes proved frustrating. In Scotland, new drugs are appraised in a clear way. 
The process is, of course, independent of ministers and parliament, and decisions are made by the Scottish Medicines Consortium. The system needs to be fair and consistent, but it also needs to be able to respond swiftly to clinical need. And pharmaceutical companies, of course, must play their part in this process by submitting a fair price, ideally the first time. The Scottish Government has listened to feedback from patients and responded to the recommendations of the Montgomery Report by working to implement a series of reforms to the system and new measures that make it easier for patients with rare conditions to access new medicines and treatments. The government has announced just this week that it has widened the definition of ultra-orphan medicines to include medicines for rare orphan diseases so that patients with rare diseases can get faster access to new medicines and to treatments. This means that if a medicine meets the definition and the Scottish Medicines Consortium considers it to be clinically effective, then patients will be able to access the new medicine on the NHS for at least three years while information on the wider effectiveness is gathered. This follows changes made this month that give doctors the right to access licensed treatments that are not generally available on the NHS on a case-by-case -case basis, making it easier for patients to get access to the specialist medicines that they need. This peer-approved clinical system, Tier 2, will act as a sort of safety valve within the system for clinicians and that non-routine access must not include cost effectiveness as part of that consideration. And this is supplemented by the new National Appeal Panel and gives a more flexible pathway for clinicians and their patients. These changes reflect the government's understanding that more can and should be done in regards to exceptional cases. And I think this amounts to major improvements in access to new drugs that have the potential to improve the quality of patients' lives. These changes by the government are significant, but it's also vital that pharmaceutical companies play their part by bringing a fair price to the process. Ultra-orphan medicines, are, as we know, are expensive, and the role of the Scottish Medicines Consortium is, of course, to ensure that best value medicines are available to the NHS in Scotland. I understand that following encouragement from the Scottish Government, both pharmaceutical companies, Vertex and Roche, have submitted new applications to the National Health Services Scotland, and I hope this will result on agreement being reached on fair prices that will enable patients in Scotland to access these medicines. And I hope these recent announcements go some way to reassuring both my constituents and patients across Scotland that the system is being reformed, it's being taken seriously, and the access to the latest medicines for those that need them is being improved significantly. Thank you very much. I call Annie Wells to be followed by Kezia Dugdale. All speakers must keep the remarks under four minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer and to the Labour Party for bringing this extremely important topic to the Chamber today. Imagine a situation whereby a family member or loved one could live longer if only they were given access to a medicine that you knew already existed. Then imagine your frustration should they be, not, should they be denied that drug. In doing so, we are getting to the crux of why this debate is so important. We've seen in the media that personal, the personal testimonies of patients who need these drugs Last month, we saw a young woman write to the First Minister to beg for access to her Canby, a drug that would improve her chances of living beyond the age of 31. And a few weeks ago, as part of Breast Cancer Now campaign, I met with a campaigner who desperately wants and needs Progetta to increase the time she has left. The specialist drugs or Canby and Progetta are potentially life-changing drugs. Or Canby, a precision medicine which targets the root cause of cystic fibrosis, has the potential to improve the lives of over 336 people in Scotland by preserving and restoring full lung function. Progetta, a drug for people with HER2 positive breast cancer, is said to prolong the lives of women with the incurable breast cancer by up to 16 months. That is why it is so important to discuss the availability of these drugs in Scotland. The Scottish Conservative Party has been consistent in calls for both drugs to be made available on the NHS. Miles Briggs hosted a cross-party cross talks on the availability of Progetta only this month 
and in May Ruth Davidson raised the issue at FMQs, stating that some breast cancer suffer sufferers had travelled to England to get access to the drug. And last week, my colleague Maurice Corey led a members' debate which called for her Cambi to be made available in Scotland. Cost, of course, will always be a factor in making such decisions, but what is clear is that the Scottish Government must provide clarity about what it intends to do going forward. There are underlying issues and reform is needed. And when it comes to negotiations, the SMC, of course, makes decisions independently of government, but it is, after all, government that sets the frame under which those decisions are made. And this is why the Scottish Government must prioritise putting in place a negotiation system that will ensure greater access to these drugs. It's been 18 months since a promise was made by the Scottish Government to do so, and I would like to call on the Cabinet Secretary to provide a clear deadline as to when we can expect this to happen. Furthermore, as alluded to in Miles Briggs Amendment, we must push for reform for, of the Patient Access Scheme Assessment Group to make access to high-cost drugs easier for patients. In addition to these reforms, I would also like to echo the calls made by Miles Briggs for a cross-border arrangement to ensure that no one misses out on crucial care. There are medicines available in Scotland that aren't available in England, which is why it is so vital for us to work together and share resources. To finish today, I would like to reiterate my support for this debate. The time has come for greater clarity surrounding new medicines, and, and we have seen in recent weeks just how pertinent the demand is for life-changing drugs to be made available in our NHS. It is our patients who are the ones who suffer with the lack of decision-making and complex discussions around cost, which of course have to be factored in. However, I call now on the Scottish Government to urgently put a new system of negotiation in place regarding these life-saving drugs. Only then will we see patients get the chance they deserve to extend their lives and give relatives a source of comfort. Thank you very much. I call Kezia Dugdale to be followed by Claire Hockey. Thank you, President Officer. And can I start by commending my colleague and friend Anas Sarwar on his persistent focus on access to medicine, a focus which has allowed us to devote Labour's debating time to it today. Uh, I wanted to um, share my experience of supporting constituents with cancer uh, in the Chamber today. And I want to make three points. Uh, one about the wider situation facing the NHS, one about the Montgomery Review and in particular the replacement for IPTRs and then finally a, a comment about Jen Hardy and her battle for Progetta. First of all, can I say to the Cabinet Secretary for Health that on my surgery uh, on Friday, uh, a woman came to see me about a family member who had been waiting over a year for an endoscopy uh, within NHS Lothian. And uh, during, she never got the treatment that she needed and she died of stomach cancer um, earlier this year. So I think the debate that we have today about access to medicine has to be seen in a wider context around the pressures on our NHS and in particular the feelings that the government consistently delivers around treatment time guarantees and that cancer is no exception to that record of failure. On the issue around the Montgomery review, I am pleased that the government has accepted the recommendations to replace IPTRs with a new system, the PAX2 system, which Anas Sarwar introduced to the chamber. I've had direct experience of trying to support two different constituents um, with an IPTR process. One of them was successful and one of them wasn't. The first one was a woman who walked into a constituency surgery uh, a few years ago who needed help to fill out all the paperwork associated with IPTR to access the drug Cadzyla for breast cancer. She was ultimately successful and she was only successful, I think, because of the sheer force and pressure put behind that campaign by Breast Cancer Now at the time, who did formidable work fighting for that drug. The second constituent that I tried to support with an IPTR was a woman with bowel cancer. And I think one of the hardest things I've ever had to do as an MSP in this chamber um, was to go and visit her in her house in Edinburgh and sit down and have a conversation with her about why she couldn't get the drug she needed for her bowel cancer after her devoting her entire uh, career to the NHS. She was a paediatric nurse. Every waking moment of her adult life had been spent working in the National Health Service and there I was sat in her living room trying to explain how it was fair that she couldn't get this drug that would have saved her life and uh, she sadly passed away in, in February of this year and she never got that particular treatment that she needed. We also know from Miles Briggs uh, and others about the uh, 
situation facing Jen Hardy. Uh, Jen Hardy should be spending her final months with us, uh, watching her daughter graduate, watch, watching her get married, spending Christmases uh, with her family, yet she's spending her time standing outside this building, educating MSPs on a drug that would have given her 16 more months to live. And the government has been dragging its heels for such a long time over the issue of Pergetta. So long, in fact, we've been waiting longer than that drug would have given Jen Hardy in extra months with the people that desperately want her by their side. So I think if there's one thing that the Cabinet Secretary takes away from today, it's please stop dragging your heels. There are people who need these drugs now. Every one of us has had the experience of trying to support a cancer patient through one of the most difficult experiences of their lives and being hit by the system time and time again. A system that is failing them and a system that we could do much, much more to improve. That power lands, lies in the Health Secretary's hands. I hope she steps up and uses it. Thank you. I call Claire Hawkey to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I would like to refer members to my entry in the Register of Interest in that my registered mental health nurse and currently hold an honorary contract with NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Like other members present, I too know of constituents and friends who have either had or are affected by breast cancer or cystic fibrosis. The impact of these illnesses doesn't only affect the patients themselves, but also their family and friends who are supporting them. And like many across this chamber, I've heard of heartbreaking stories from constituents whose lives have been turned upside down by breast cancer and cystic fibrosis. And it's for that reason that I fully applaud the tenacity of the campaigns led by Breast Cancer Now and the Cystic Fibrosis Trust in calling on authorities to widen access to medicines for such conditions. Their campaigning has helped to educate MSPs and the wider public on the merits of widening access to these drugs and for that we owe them a debt of gratitude. Presiding officer, as we've heard, the Scottish Government has significantly improved access to new medicines in recent years. Figures show that between 2011 and 2013, the combined acceptance rate for orphan and cancer medicines was 48%. Whilst in the last three years, under the new approach, the Scottish Medicines Consortium approved 79% of such medicines. And there can be no doubt that these drugs have changed lives. However, we can always improve and build upon our processes and learn from our own past experiences and evidence-based best practice from other nations. Following the recommendations laid out in the Montgomery report, I welcome the government's commitment in reforming the systems which are currently in place and in introducing changes that will enable medicines to get to the people who need them. Only yesterday, as we've heard, the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport announced that the Scottish Government is, announced, is introducing a new definition of ultra-orphan medicines, which will give the Scottish Medicines Consortium the ability to treat some medicines for rare orphan diseases as ultra-orphan medicines. In effect, the changes will mean that if the medicine meets the new definition of an ultra-orphan medicine and the SMC consider it clinically effective, then it will be available in the NHS for at least three years while information on its effectiveness is gathered. This is one of a number of steps being taken to ensure that access to vital medicines is widened. And with these new rules for medicines, faster access to new treatment will become a reality. President Officer, I wish to reiterate reiterate that medicine approval decisions are not taken by MSPs nor are they taken by government. This is the role of the Scottish Medicines Consortium which as the Cabinet Secretary said rightly acts independently of ministers and parliament. Nobody wants to be in a situation where certain medicines are rejected and it's entirely appropriate that it's a decision that is carefully taken based on sound clinical evidence and by an independent body. Like others here, I welcome Roshi's announcement that they are to make a new submission to the SMC on Progetta, and I urge Vertex to do likewise for our Canby as quickly as possible. But, President Officer, we cannot allow our health service to be held to ransom by pharmaceutical companies, and we must encourage them to offer fair and transparent prices for the products. Everyone here is in agreement that we want these drugs to be made available to the people of Scotland. However, there must be fairness in the costs of the drugs supplied. 
I therefore welcome the commitment made by the Association of the British Pharmaceutical Industry that its members will provide Scotland with the same discounts offered elsewhere in the UK for accessing medications. Presiding officers, Parliament has spoken today with one clear voice in calling for all pharmaceutical companies to play their part and bring a fair price first time to the drugs appraisal process. Quite rightly, people should not be losing out to profits. Thank you very much. I call Alexander Stewart to be followed by Ivan McKee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am delighted to have the opportunity of taking part in today's debate and pay tribute to the Labour Party for bringing this forward and Anasawa for the campaign he's brought himself. As we know, these serious issues, uh, cystic fibrosis and breast cancer, are two completely separate conditions. However, they do have a common thread that they are both attributed to genetics. This has reached a condition, and, uh, and as we've seen, individuals who have these diseases uh, have tried their best to do all they can, and companies themselves have consistently had an uphill struggle in ensuring that we, they can successfully provide treatments for patients. However, thankfully to no small part, uh, current knowledge and expertise have ensured that two drugs are now available for cystic fibrosis and HRT positive breast cancer. Firstly, Ocambi, a different type of traditional treatment for cystic fibrosis because it is a precision medicine. Uh, the traditional medicines uh, that have damaged occurs uh, and this illness and the type of illness that they've seen uh, has, has progressed further. So the, the following on this precision medicine, it targets the root cause, having the potential uh, to ensure that the lung function is restored and the, the, the decline subsides. Cystic Fibrosis Trust have recognised that there are currently 336 people in Scotland who could benefit from having access to this drug, which is one third of the 900 people across the country who are living with CF. Progetta and a, is a newly developed drug for people with HR2 positive breast cancer, which has been created uh, by the pharmaceutical society company Roche. And we've heard today how people in England, women in England and Wales can get this drug, but people in Scotland cannot. Progetta uh, gives the patients with cancer uh, had the opportunity uh, to have their treatment uh, increased and it will give them the opportunity for 16 months, uh, presiding officer. That's a lifeline to many patients. Uh, that gives them the opportunity to ensure that they spend more time with their families and loved ones. And they need that access now, not later. So Deputy Presiding Officer, given the facts and the benefits that we know that Okambi and Progetta are available, but they're not available to Scottish patients, uh, Patients cannot understand why they are seen or not seen as a priority. Why are they not being given this opportunity? Many are living and, the, and their life expectancy is shortened and they die because they do not have the drug. The Scottish Conservatives have made it quite clear on numerous occasions in this Parliament that Ocambi should be available and we've been discussing that since 2016. Indeed, Ocambi was made available on a debate last week, and I pay tribute to Maurice Corrie, MSP, who called for a portfolio approach on which medicines with cystic fibrosis become available for patients in the country uh, to ensure that the manufacturers are licensed. Deals of this type have already taken place across uh, other parts of the country, and people want to know why it's cost and bureaucracy that are stopping this from happening. Doctors can move a patient onto new medicines if they believe that the access to the patient will ensure that they have a longer life expectancy, and we should be providing that. Ruth Davison has made it quite clear, and she talked about Progetta at First Minister's Questions only last month, and I pay tribute to my other colleague, Miles Briggs, who held a cross-party talks last month specifically on this topic. Uh, and we've talked also about the Scottish Parliament uh, looking at Progetta across a cross-border arrangement to ensure that no one misses out on the crucial drugs that are taking place. But, presiding officer, it comes back to choice. These are choices that are being made. These are choices that have been made by the Scottish Government and Scottish Ministers. So we must make the right choices, choose the choices for the people of Scotland. They deserve nothing less. Enough is enough. Thank you very much. And I call Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Now, I welcome the opportunity to take part in this debate on access to uh, new medicines. The movers of the resolution and all of us in the chamber want to achieve the best results for all sufferers of rare conditions in Scotland who require orphan, ultra-orphan and end-of-life medication. For the sufferers and their families, the importance of this issue cannot be overstated. And I join with other members in paying tribute to those who campaign tirelessly 
on this issue. As MSPs, we all have constituency cases where access to new medicines would make a transformational difference to the lives of individuals. And ensuring robust, independent processes are in place to bring new drugs into use is therefore of critical importance. The Montgomery Review commissioned by the Scottish Government to look into this issue made a number of recommendations, including on data sets, definitions, negotiations, new ultra orphan pathways and arrangements on funding, which the Government has confirmed it will be implementing. The Montgomery Review concludes that access to end-of-life orphan and ultra-orphan medicines has increased through steps taken by the Government, including the use of individual patient treatment requests and the peer-approved clinical system packs. Indeed, the percentage of new drugs approved has increased from 48% in the period 2011-13 to 79% over the past three years as a result of investment and reforms to approval processes. The Scottish Government put in place a new medicines fund to provide additional support to NHS boards to meet the cost of these drugs and commits to continue to use all the funding from, from the pharmaceutical price regulation scheme rebate to support the NMF. The Scottish Medicines Consortium will introduce a new ultra-orphan pathway with an option to recommend a medicine on an interim basis. Doctors on behalf of patients can seek access to licensed treatments not generally available in the NHS in Scotland with the rollout of PACs. And a new national appeal panel... Sure. Kibili. I'm wondering whether he would agree with me that there is actually a gap, a gap between ultra-orphan medicines, which are covered by the new pathway, and actually the SMC process. For those orphan conditions, there's actually that nothing that suits them just now. Would he agree that we should fix that? Ivan McKee. I think everything needs to be looked at to make sure there are no gaps. I know the, 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 the changes I'm outlining at the moment that the government has done and, and is looking at will go away to address that and should continue to do so. Doctors on behalf of patients can seek access to licensed treatments not generally available on the NHS in Scotland with the rollout of PACs. And a new national appeal panel will be introduced for individual requests to allow for medicines not approved by the SMC and greater cognizance of lived experience will be taken into account in decisions to fund new medicines. This issue of negotiation figured prominently in the Labour motion with calls for a new system of negotiations to be implemented. The market for medicines, in particular new medicines, is particularly complex, involving, as it does, assessments of the recovery of research and development costs essential to ensure the pipeline of new medicine development is not slowed. The process is also further complicated by the multi-layer processes involved in UK pricing negotiations. Indeed, the Scottish Government's calls for the UK's PPRS to provide full transparency in pricing among the four UK administrations is to be welcomed to ensure that NHS Scotland is fully engaged in this process and can leverage best pricing as a consequence. Given that ultra-orphan drugs are often very expensive, it's also vital that pharmaceutical companies play their part and bring a fair price first time to the process. In conclusion, presiding officer, development in drug technology will continue apace. And this, of course, is to be welcome, providing cures conditions that would have been possible until recently. The needs of sufferers who require access to the latest medicines is a priority, and ensuring the process in place for approval delivers for them is of critical importance. I therefore welcome the steps the Scottish Government continues to make to Please improve continue, access to new medicines and calls for all parties to get around the table to make progress on the specifics. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now move to closing speeches. I'm afraid we still have to restrict comments to four minutes. Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I, I'm pleased to close this debate uh, on behalf of the Scottish Conservative Party. And can I thank Labour Party for giving us the opportunity to once again highlight for me what amounts to an anomaly in the process of approving drugs for general use, particularly when considering portfolio medicines. This is especially true in the cases of the drugs Bergetta or Acambi, and we've heard today how Bergetta can prolong the lives of those suffering from terminal breast cancer by up to 16 months. We've heard how Acambi, unlike traditional medicines for the treatment of cystic fibro fibrosis, targets the root cause of the condition and has the potential to preserve or even restore lung function, improving life expectancy and the quality of life of patients. And presenting officers, when, I, when I'm writing speeches in this chamber, I tend to shy away uh, from quoting from constituents. But in this case, I'm going to make an exception because their experiences and words highlight this issue far better 
than I ever could. Willie Rennie has already mentioned uh, Ruth McElhenney, who herself has a young son. Her mother wrote to me uh, uh, and asked that I speak on her behalf. She says, and I quote, from this early age, her daily regime of medication was huge. 60 tablets a day with added ones when required and intravenous antibiotics on occasion too. She has also had a daily physiotherapy from us twice a day and every kind of activity added to keep her fit and active, keeping her lungs in good shape. This must have cost us thousands of pounds over the years with dancing four or five times a week, singing and trumpet lessons. We've never regretted one penny of what we have spent on this wonderful, kind-hearted, intelligent young woman. Having completed a degree in performance music, she has gone on to work with children and young adults with autism, now a piano teacher herself. She also has worked extremely hard on her fitness as an adult, which is the main reason she has got herself to 31 years old, and we've mentioned 31 as a key age before. As I've said before, she is now a mum too, dedicating her energy to bringing up her four-year-old son, but now in a downward spiral with her health, having more hospital admissions in the last six months than ever before, and having struggled with her lungs and her bill with blockages now regular occurrence and chest infections too. She goes on to say, Ruth is desperate to stay alive, to see her son grow up, to take him to school, high school and beyond, which is what most of us as parents take for granted. I cannot therefore understand why there is a drug which could potentially transform her life, sitting on a shelf while people say the cost is not worth it for her and the many more wonderful, courageous young cystic fibrosis warriors. They have battled for so long already along with us. I am hoping and praying that today will be a landmark day to change their lives forever, giving them the gift of improved health and long life. And, and Willie Rennie has already said that today, Ruth attended the funeral of her last surviving uh, cystic fibrosis uh, a clinic friend from Crosshouse Hospital. He was 26 years old, five years younger than my constituent's daughter. Presenting officer, time is precious when we're talking about improving the quality of lives, when we're talking about giving people time with their families, when we're talking about continuing, allowing people to continue to achieve, like in the case of Ruth. Most debates in this place are about finding a way to gain a political inch from our opponents or dodge a bullet of intervention or, or get out of here unscathed having landed a blow. But not today. Today isn't about politics. Today is about finding a way and quickly to resolve a situation that is eminently solvable. Cabinet Secretary, I fully recognise that it's not, it's not for politicians to make medical decisions and there's always a tension between what medicines are passed and those that are, that are rejected. But can I say, Cabinet Secretary, Please, get the parties round the table, find a solution, because this is most definitely within your power, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much. And I call the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I think this has been a, a very a good debate and some very uh, powerful speeches. And uh, I certainly um, think that that has, I hope, united the Chamber in a number of respects, and I'll come back to that in, in a second. I want to try to deal with it, as many issues that have been raised. Obviously, I won't be able to deal with all of them in the, the time allotted. Uh, I thought Annie Wells uh, made a point uh, that really answered um, the, the point made by Anna Sauer and others. Of course, there will be drugs north and south of the border that uh, are not available either north and south of the border. Uh, and that is because we have the different uh, assessment processes. So there will be drugs available in Scotland that are not available uh, in England. And that is the, the, the systems that we have. But they should all be based around the clinical evidence. Uh, and I'll come back to that because I thought Jackie Bailey made a, an important point in that uh, respect. Uh, Anna Sarwan and others talked about the portfolio approach and, and Jackie Bailey mentioned this as well. Uh, now, of course, the portfolio issue wasn't raised by Montgomery or, or anyone else in terms of recommendations. And whether or not it's officials here in Scotland or indeed officials in England, they all have concerns about a portfolio approach for two very important reasons. One is that it seeks to bypass the standard health technology assessment process. And if we are all agreed, and I haven't heard anyone in the chamber this afternoon say that clinical effectiveness processes have to be tested and met. Now, everyone has agreed that, and everyone has said that these medicines have to be licensed. So the current portfolio approach then needs to be revisited uh, by the manufacturers of our CAMBI. And I think that's a very, yes, in a minute, that's a very powerful message 
for this chamber to send uh, to Vertex and any other pharmaceutical companies because the systems have to be reformed, I agree, but clinical effectiveness still has to be uh, established and the medicines have to be licensed for patient safety reasons. I think something that Jackie Bailey, you yourself said. Jackie um, Bailey. I do, and let me quote from a Vertex statement made following their meeting with the Scottish Government on the 18th of June, because they say um, that this will accelerate access to our pipeline of potential new CF treatments after license. So those tests that she wants and I want to see um, th about the clinical safety of that drug would have been carried out. There is nothing to stop you from engaging in a portfolio agreement that would save lives. Camera Secretary. Well, um, it, obviously, it's not for government to do that. It's for the SMC to do that. But of course, there were unlicensed medicines in that portfolio. Now, if things have moved on from that, that is to be welcomed. And of course, dialogue continues. There has been a lot of dialogue with Vertex, not just from Scottish government officials, but from national procurement. And I hope from that last round of discussions that progress may be able uh, to be made. And I would certainly encourage uh, all of that. Willie Rennie raised uh, uh, an issue, um, and I want to be as clear as I possibly can here, because uh, he asked why Progetta, the Progetta deal was not available in Scotland. Now, NHS England has come to a confidential commercial deal with Roche. The details of that cannot be shared between administrations for commercial confidential reasons. But unlike, unlike standard discounts, when they can be, and that's why we need transparency and price parity written into the new PPRS. I can't, I can't emphasise that enough. That is really important going forward because that transparency doesn't allow me to tell Willie Rennie some of the detail that might actually be quite helpful. No, I'm sorry, there's no time, Cabinet Secretary, to take right. an intervention. OK, so well, look, I uh, will write to members about the specific issues that they raise, but I think the message that uh, we could all agree on in this debate is that we all want medicines to get into the hands of patients as quickly as possible. I want that. Obviously, these decisions are not made rightly by politicians, but we have improved the systems in order to deliver that aim. I would encourage Vertex to continue to have those discussions, to get a new submission to SMC, and uh, to make sure that uh, that is a, a fair price as quickly as possible. And I think that would be well received. Thank you. And I call David Stewart to conclude our debate. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And this has been a productive debate with passionate and well-informed contributions from across the Chamber. At one level, President Officer, discussions on the licensing of medicines and negotiations with drug companies can become quite technical and abstract. But let's never forget the outcomes of these debates have real-life impacts for the individuals affected. We've had passionate contributions and examples from across the chamber, from Ahmed Sawar, Jackie Bailey, Kez Dagdale, Miles Briggs, Ash Denham and Brian Little. Uh, orphan and ultra-orphan medicines may only treat a few hundred people per year in Scotland. That does not mean they should be overlooked. Every delay to improving the system of negotiations is another day that women with incurable HER2 positive breast cancer have to face less time with their loved ones. It's another day in which lives are lost because people with cystic fibrosis are denied access to the drug or can be. Now, the government this week has made some improvements regarding access to medicines with the PACS Tier 2 system and the newly announced Ultra Orphan Pathway. Whilst this is a step in the right direction, action is still too slow. It's been two years since the Montgomery Review, and many patients do not have access to these important, life-sustaining drugs. Now, campaigners, President Officer, are rightly frustrated at the lack of progress that's been made in Scotland in negotiations with manufacturers Roche and Vertex about Pergetta and Rakambi. This is especially so when a deal has been made to allow women in NHS access to project in England and Wales, the discrepancy provision just a few miles across the border is a daily growing injustice. Now, as my colleague Anna Sauer said in his excellent speech, and I quote presiding officer, women in England, Wales and Northern Ireland can get project on the NHS as a matter of course, but in Scotland, Scotland they can't. It's been rejected three times by the SMC as it's not considered cost effective. Despite being recognised as clinically effective, again I say, what cost on lives? Uh, Miles Briggs, I think in an excellent speech, talked about the summit that he hosted on Project and he should be welcome for the work he's done on this. The message from campaigners is keep on working with the Scottish Government, SNG 
and industry stop this injustice, he said, and that patients, of course, value the last few months with their family and young children. Too many families, he said, face barriers to getting drugs. Alison Johnson made some excellent points. I would particularly highlight her point about the government getting a, a crown licence, which is a very important initiative, and the fact that we have patent-backed monopolies on many occasions. We need to change, she said, the approval framework, which is vitally uh, important. I think Min Willie Rennie made some excellent points as well. He talked about the advance in medical science, which now gives hope to many people who in the past would have had very little hope. We, of course, need innovation in health, he said, but it can't be done at any price or any effectiveness. Jackie Bailey made a very uh, powerful speech, a very personal speech of examples that she has come across. She said there's an opportunity now to do something about it and mention the portfolio deals that many other countries like Sweden uh, and the USA had carried out. And Ash Denman talked about the pressing concerns from her constituents with life-threatening conditions and that companies need to play their part uh, offering a fair price. And many other speakers like Annie Wells, Ivan McKee, Claire Hockey um, and uh, Alexander Stewart made excellent contributions. In the very little time I've got left, presiding officer, uh, growing medical research is growing and developing apace. But if assistance or approval are still too slow in response, if we continue to be reactive instead of proactive, the same problems will occur again and again as new drugs are developed and medical treatment move forward. New pathways and systems may sound good, but we not have the confidence of patients or this chamber unless they are shown to have real results. I therefore urge the government to heed the call of campaigners and act now without delay to make Projeca and Ocambi available in the NHS to those who need it now. Only then and then alone can it be claimed that true progress has been achieved. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on access to vital medicines. The next item of business is consideration of two business motions, motion 12877, setting out a business programme, and motion 12878 on the timetable for a bill at stage two. Uh, if anyone objects, please say so now. And could I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motions? Formally moved. Thank you very much. No one seems to object. Therefore, the question is that motions 12877 and 12878 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The next item is consideration of five parliamentary bureau motions. Could I ask Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the bureau to move motions 12879 to 12881 and motions 12896 and 12897? Moved on block. Thank you very much. There are seven questions today as a result of business. The first question is that mo amendment 12861.2 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, which seeks to amend motion 12861 in the name of Rhoda Grant on a review of government FOI handling and record keeping be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 12861.2 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick is yes 66, no 59. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is the amendment 12861.1 in the name of Edward Mountain, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Rhoda Grant, is agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that motion 12861 in the name of Rhoda Grant on a review of, as amended, on a review of government FOI handling and record keeping be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that amendment 12856.3 in the name of Shuna Robertson, which seeks to amend motion 12856 in the name of Anas Sarwar on access to vital medicines be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that amendment 12856.1 in the name of Miles Briggs, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Anas Sarwar be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that motion 12856 in the name of Anna Sarwar as amended on access to vital medicines be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. 
I propose to ask a single question on the five parliamentary bureau motions. If anyone objects, please say so now. No one objects. Therefore, the question is that motions 12879 to 12881 and motions 12896 and 12897, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Bureau, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll move now to members' business in the name of Adam Tompkins on Welcome to Glasgow, a world city of music. We'll just take a few moments, pause, while members and ministers change seats.